Can you hear me? 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 Are you ready? Test right one, two. Here? Test, 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 test. Ready. Can you hear me? No, I didn't turn it off. It's on. Okay. Woo! That's hot. Take it over, John. You ready, David? All right, everybody. Welcome to the sanctuary where we are small, but we are mighty, where two or more are gathered. everybody.
Here's a clever one. How are you? Price, come here. Price, heel. All right. As you guys are finding your seats, we can fellowship more afterwards. I promise we will not run you out. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we continue in our time of worship. Lord, we are grateful. We thank you for this cool weather you've brought to us. Thank you for the rain you've given us recently. We thank you for how you replenish the land, you replenish our souls. We ask that you would um, speak to us today from your word, because we're listening for you. And Lord, I just pray over each person here, whatever they came in these doors with, fears, anxieties, things that are just going on that are hard in their lives, or things that they're celebrating, any of these things, Lord, we just put them before you. And we ask that you would just work in us and through us, you would help us to sustain. You would help us to get through tough times. You'd help us to celebrate and hold on to the good times. And Lord, we just ask right now that you would receive this time of worship as us giving a little bit of what you've given us back to you and that you would receive it as just an aroma in your midst. So Lord, we invite you and we ask that you would be with us today in Jesus' name. I'm sorry. Is that the wrong song? I'll do that song. I'm sorry, y'all. Here, I'll switch it real quick. I'll do that one. You ready? Let's go come to the altar, right?
We got through that one, y'all. Thank you so much, John. Always appreciate that. Well, today um, we are going to conclude um, our series, our message series called Northern Lights. 
We've been talking about the aurora borealis and how God kind of takes dark places and makes treasures. And it's based off Isaiah 45, 3. And so let's read it one more time together. It says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. God promises us that there are treasures in darkness, hidden riches of secret places. And so these Northern Light series is what it's all about is it's just it's not about one thing. It's about really the combination or this kind of coming together, clashing together of different things, right? And it, it comes from this idea that we talked about the, the first week, the Aurora Borealis. It's all about a reaction. If you have these plasma leaving the sun at a million miles per hour, right? Uh, and it's traveling all the way, 93 million miles uh, after that eruption, and it's coming towards the earth, and the earth has this protection magnetic field around it, but it, it finds its way to the weakest points, which is the north and the south pole. And then this plasma kind of enters the earth's atmosphere. And when it interacts with the oxygen and the nitrogen, and it starts to make blues and greens and reds and shimmering lights. And it puts on quite a display. This interaction is what leads us to these wonderful things in secret places, the northern lights. And so we're going to be talking about the ingredients of what uh, is in this collection of these talks and this, this scripture we're going to talk about, how things come together. We're talking about the pain and the darkness and the hard times. And we're talking about God's goodness and his identity and his steadfastness and his resolute love for us. In week one, we talked about finding God's word in our heart, or hiding God's word in our heart, and the power of scripture memory, so that when we're in dark places, we always have the word with us. And then we talked last week about hard times, and the difficult times, and suffering, and pain, and going through difficult things, that when we face the things and the difficult pain of this world, that we're not alone, that pain has a problem because it won't last forever. But we have a promise of a heaven and a residence that lasts forever. When we know, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we know we are bought and we are paid for, and now we have eternal life. And eternal life doesn't begin when we die. Eternal life begins when we begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. We bring the kingdom down to heaven. Our job is to be a light in a dark world. And God shows us an amazing display when he puts pain and his promises together in our lives. And just the northern lights is just one of the things of this earthly way that God says, let me remind you. Just like he reminds us of promises with rainbows and different things and in earthly ways, he says, I'm giving you a small glimpse of who I am and the promises I give for you. So, this week I, I want to talk about this idea of secret places. I want to focus on that part of the verse where it says, hidden riches of secret places. So we're going to talk about these secret places, and practically speaking today, uh, our talk could be like a guide, uh, a guide to going dark. Ever heard the term going dark, right? It's, uh, it's really a military term. Um, and God's giving us riches in this idea of going dark. He's riches in the hidden things, in the dark places. And so think of this as a guide of going dark or dropping off the grid would be kind of the military term. When uh, a military team goes dark, you can't really communicate with them the way you used to. And so when a team goes dark, it's like, hey, we need to tell that SEAL team this or that or the other. And they're like, nope, they've already gone dark. We, we can't, can't reach them. They're, they're in the wind. They're dark. 
And so, um, you know, and that language kind of pulls over into today's language. I remember when we were remodeling our house, we hadn't moved into it yet, and my contractor was supposed to meet me right after lunch. And I got there, and he was late, and he comes, and he says, hey, I'm sorry, we went to go eat at the Ridge, uh, but it was Monday. It had gone dark. And so he said we had to drive all the way back in town to eat lunch and then come back out here. And I was like, I, I didn't understand. I wasn't from here. I'm like, oh, the restaurant just closes on Monday. Okay. <laughs> But he had said the restaurant had gone dark. And so, you know, you can drive by Chick-fil-A today. It's gone dark. Uh, they, they, you know, they don't know the Sabbath is really on Saturday. We should be eating uh, some serious chicken today, right? But <laughs> I got an amen from Manuel on that one. So this idea of going dark is something that now we have pulled into our vernacular today. It's not just a military term. But what I want to talk about today is that there are basically two different times that we deal with secret places or hidden places or times of going dark. And there, these times are times that we choose secret places. There's times when we choose secret places, and then there are times when secret places are chosen for us. The secret, we choose the secret places, and sometimes the secret places choose us. And we're going to talk about those two different times, and we're going to kind of focus on how they are different, but yet God many times shows up in the same way, because he is in the hidden places. He's in the dark places. So here's the first part, right? This guide of going dark, I want you to think about that as we choose darkness, right? So I want you to think about the fact that Yes, I want you to choose darkness. And you're like, well, that is really strange, right? We talk about God as the light of the world. Why do you want us to choose darkness? And so when you choose darkness, we have to choose hiddenness or choose secret places regularly. If you're going to have a guide for going dark, you need to choose hidden places regularly. And here's what I mean by that. If, if you want to see the aurora borealis, you've got to go to dark places. If you want to experience sometimes the hidden treasure of God, you've got to go to the quiet place. You've got to go to the hidden place. You've got to go to the dark place. And you need to choose it regularly. I want to encourage you to do this. I'm, you know, I'm telling you this as a pastor. I'm telling you this because something is good about God in the secret places. He loves secret places. He loves to meet us there. Psalms 1811 says this, he made darkness his secret place. His canop canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. He put himself in a dark place and you go, that seems strange, right? But what he's saying is he wants you to come to him in a dark place. So we're going to try and we're going to choose and we're going to prioritize secret places because God loves secret places. He loves to dwell in these secret places. Psalms 27 5 says this, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the, say it with me, right? Secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. When you need a refuge, he says, come on. If you're playing hide and seek and you got, you're not so good at hiding, but somebody else is, and they go, come on, come on, come on, over here. They know. God's saying, come on, I'll hide you right in here. The world's hard. The world's coming at you. You need a refuge. Come on, come to my secret place. So we choose the secret place. He hides us there. He will set me high as a result upon his rock, a firm foundation, so that storms can't destroy me. Because we're attached to the firm rock. That's what God promises us in his word. If we want to be where God is, he chooses secret places. So we must go be and spend time with him in these secret places. Now, Jesus said, when you pray, don't try to make everyone know 
how spiritual you are, right? He said, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. See, God loves that secret place. He loves to meet you, just you and him. He wants you to prioritize that place. He wants to prioritize that time, and he wants it to happen regularly. God wants to meet with you. I had a friend of mine that I used to serve with at a church in San Antonio, and he wrote a song, A Table for Two. You know, just a table for two. It's reserved. He's always there, and he wants you to sit and eat and drink and fellowship with him regularly. Elijah found this out, right? Elijah, he thought God would be in the earthquake. He thought God would be in the fire. He thought God would be in the wind. He thought God would be in all of these things. But God was in the still, small voice. Matthew 6, 6 says, And the Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. So this idea of don't pray out loud and be all boisterous and, and do these things out in the open, but do it in the secret place. This is a time when the religious leaders, they wore all these special robes and tassels and all these other things, and they would go out in the public and they would show off their status and their religiosity. They were very outward and obvious with their, their religiousness. And they would pray loudly on the street corners and they would say these thou's of thou doest of thou thee and big, big words and make people know how important they were. But it's not about what you do for him. It's about what he did for you. And you secretly just delight in him, enjoying him. That's what he's wanting. He doesn't want a big show. He just wants you. Now, Jesus lived this way. And, and so if we want to be Christ-like, Jesus lived this life of secrecy a lot. And we can see that in the scriptures. Um, he had this secret relationship between him and God. And it was beautiful to see this relationship at work. So uh, I'll kind of just tell you a story. One day he was with his brothers, actually. And his brothers were saying, hey, Jesus, if you want to be known, come on, man, you want to be the, the bomb, you can't be hiding out in these podunk towns in Galilee. You've got to go to the big city. You've got to make a big splash. You've got to go and go where the politics is happening. You've got to go to Washington, D.C., my friend. You've got to march. You've got to do that. You've got to go on the big show. you got to go where the feast is happening. So this is a time where the feast uh, uh, would be where everybody would come to Jerusalem. Everybody would, from all around would come. And they're like, man, you, you got to go. You got to be there. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I, I don't need to do that. I, it's not my time yet. And so Jesus, he knew when his time was, and he wasn't going to be dictated by the, the guides of men. He had a relationship with God. In his secret time with God, he knew when and where and how to be. And he wasn't going to listen to men. Even his brothers, they weren't going to pressure him in his life. He was not going to live from the narrative that man made. He was going to live from a secret given to him by his father. His secret mission and this whisper from a father and so he said, I won't do it. So what did he actually do? Well, we read this. We pick this up in John 7, 10. It says, but when his brothers had gone up already, so they had gone into Jerusalem for the feast, then he also went up to the feast. You're like, wait a minute. I thought he said he wasn't going to do it. But then look at this. Not openly. He went as it were. Say it with me in secret yeah very very sneaky dude right he went in secret jesus was right he was doing what god wanted him to do not what people wanted to do he was living from his hidden secret and from this hidden message that he had got 
from his father. Repeated visits to secret places. That's how he knew what his father wanted him to do. You can read through all the Gospels, and you'll see how Jesus spent many, many times going back and forth, back and forth from secret places. He would retreat very often. I'll just read you one example. Luke 6, 12 says this, And these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. He retreated. He didn't always want the limelight. He had the biggest crowds. But then he would retreat. He would go back and he'd spend time with his father. He needed to get that secret message. What was God trying to tell him? This is just one example. There's so many in the scriptures. You can go and you can read them. He was modeling for us how to relate to our father. Fueled and powered by the secret places. So you have to keep going back and you have to keep recharging. You have to go to the recharging station. You're like an EV, you know, you can't go too far. You got to go charge up, right? And some of you are weak today. Some of you have been falling into temptation again. Some of you are tempted to go, oh God, God, you, you must not love me. Well, that's just not true. God does love you. And God wants you to come and spend time with him in the secret place. It's more like you just haven't been recharging lately. So you got to get to that secret place. And you'll find your soul beginning to sing again. You'll find that you are not impressed by the corruption and the whims and the ways of this fleshly world. You'll look to him and his word and who he is, and that will guide you more than the things around you. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God to come upon you again. You just need to get back to your true center. And there's a beautiful, beautiful thing there. The more time you spend with Jesus in the secret place, the more he's going to allow you to understand his secret counsel. He's going to open up the word to you. He's going to open up what he means and what he has planned for your life. The more you spend with him, the more he's going to reveal things in your life that you thought you didn't really know. Things are going to come alive. Psalms 25, 14 says this, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. In Deuteronomy, there's a saying, it says, The secret things belong to God, but as we walk with him, we get trusted with secret wisdom. It's one thing to kind of stumble upon God in secret places. Sometimes that happens, right? We just kind of try to figure out God and try to do this, you know, church thing. And we try to read the Bible and we kind of just stumble along and we, we kind of get glimpses occasionally. We, we kind of accidentally do that. And I shared with you all the first week that Melly and I kind of accidentally found the Northern Lights. I was in a really dark place. I just had a surgery, and we were driving home from the surgery in the middle of the night. And Melanie, I thought, you know, I didn't know what was in the road. I didn't know what we were doing. She was just like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. And she just pulled over and watched. We just kind of stumbled upon it. We didn't mean to put ourselves in that place. We just kind of ended up there. Life circumstances put us there, and God just wanted to say, I'm here. And that happens. God's, God's going to meet you where you are sometimes. But what I believe the scripture's telling us is sometimes you've got to purposely go where God is. You can't always leave it up to God to come find you. God says, come meet with me. Knock and the door will be open. Just come on. Come on over. Let's eat. Come on over. Let's spend time together. Give me a call. 
Get away from all this worldly stuff and just spend time with me. And if you don't, he'll, he'll let you stumble upon him. He won't leave you. He's never far. He's never far. But he wants you to seek him. And when you seek him, you will find him. Um, there are actually aurora hunters, if you didn't know this. They like try to figure out where to go and how to exactly see this. And they have certain a uh, list of things you need to do to be able to see an aurora borealis or the northern lights. First thing is timing. You need to be up at the peak times, which is around 1 to 3 o'clock in the morning. So some of you are like, I'm out. Um, and the further north you are, the better. And some of you are like, I'm a southerner. Nope. Mason-Dixon line, as far as I go, out again. Who knows? Um, so you want to be out there at 1 to 3 in the morning. You want to be as far north as possible. You want to be in a remote and dark area, no city lights. You want to be remote. And then you want to be in the presence of storms. And you're like, okay, this all just sounds ridiculous. You want me to go north and be a Yankee? You want me to be up at 1 o'clock in the morning? You want me to go out in the middle of storms? No, I'm going to sleep. Right? But that's what these guys are saying. If you want to see the northern lights, these are the things you have to do. And so there's a pastor in Montana his name is Levi Lesko. He actually pastors a church up near Kalispell, um, which is just outside of Glacier National Park. And so he had kind of been following some of these aurora hunters. And so he had seen the aurora borealis, kind of like Melly and I had seen it just by accident. His flight got in late, so he was up in the middle of the night. He was headed home, and he was like, oh, my gosh, I've been up a little too late. He's looking at the sky. He's like, what is going on? Oh, my goodness, somebody slipped me something on the airplane. And then finally he realized, oh my gosh, it's the Aurora Borealis. And so he just stumbled upon it. But he was like, I want to see it again. He said, that was kind of like the gateway drug. Now I got to see it again. And so he had studied these Aurora hunters. And so he decided one night, it was a, a solar storm, supposedly it hit. And so they can kind of predict these because it takes about 18 hours to get to the earth, right? And so they knew that this was a good night. And so he went out to Glacier National Park in the middle of the night. And he went past the gate, and there's this telescope area just inside the park, evidently. I've never been there, so I don't know. Uh, but it's just inside the park, and he's like, okay, I'm camping out here. But, you know, he could just see enough to see all these shadows. He said, I saw more bears than I'd ever seen in my life. And so I wasn't going any further in the park. I'm like, I'm good, right? He was good right there. He was like, I'm just going to hang out here. And sure enough, just a few minutes later, the, the, the sky lit up. And he saw a little bit, but it was kind of the same as the first time. It wasn't, he didn't get to see all the blues and the greens. He kind of saw more of this, you know, shimmering haziness and kind of ripples in the sky, but he didn't see the full color uh, and those kind of things. And so he came back and he was telling one of his friends, he was like, yeah, I went out last night to Glacier and I, I saw the, the, the northern lights, but I had just gone in, man, I was a little scared. It was a little creepy in the middle of the night at Glacier, not anybody out there. Uh, and so I didn't go very far in, and so I didn't get to see it really well, but I got to see it. And he goes, oh, man, too bad. And he was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, a friend of mine sent me a picture because he went deep into the park that night. And so I have a picture of the one that he sent to his friend, and they're going to put it up on the screen for you. And it was just beautiful. All these different colors. <laughs> just kind of coming off of the lake and stars in the sky and pinks and blues and greens. But he didn't go deep into the dark place. He just kind of stood on the edge. Now he said, now give me a break. I'm a father of a few kids. I didn't want to get eaten by a bear. But, you know, but I missed out. And sometimes as Christians, we kind of want to dip our toe in the water and say, okay, God, I'll, I'll, I'll read a verse. Maybe, maybe I'll do the verse of the day off a of you version and then I'll say a quick prayer over my meal, and then I'm off on my day. And you'll, you'll experience God. But if you want to really experience the fullness, you've got to seek him in these treasures, hidden, secret places. That's where he wants to meet with you on a regular basis. And so I just challenge you to do that. So... Basically, I'm not saying that to be irresponsible 
and to just go off grid and never talk to anybody. But you're going to need to unplug. You're going to need to leave some of this world behind for a period of time. You can still be, you know, let your wife know where you are. Make sure you're somewhat accessible, but make sure you're not accessible by Instagram, by Facebook. Maybe turn your volume down. Maybe just unplug from some things and plug into God and his word and who he is. Don't go missing. Just go deep into God. So get off the grid. Be still. Go by still waters. Lift your eyes. Bend your knees. Catch your breath because he wants to meet with you. Psalm 36, 8 says, Abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, drink from the rivers of his pleasures. You got to just sit by the river. You got to drink it in. Don't just splash your face and run on by. Sink it in. Let it be there. So basically, here's what I've said in the first half of this talk. is I've said, have a, have a quiet time. Put your dumb phone away. And enjoy a good sunrise. And y'all are like, yeah, yippee, all right, that's great. So that was the easy part of the sermon. You're like, yeah, we can just leave here. We're done, right? Let's go, let's go eat. But here's the other part of it. Here's the difficult half of the sermon. The difficult half of the sermon is that, yes, sometimes we prioritize, we make room, we go to the secret places, but other times we are put in the secret places. We don't choose them. They're chosen for us. The dark seasons, the difficult seasons. And that's where God wants to develop your soul, your character, and your future. You need secret seasons, even the ones you don't choose for yourself. You need to be hidden for a time and follow his voice and do what he's telling you to do. Sometimes we just end up, even though we say, we followed you, we did exactly what you wanted me to do, God, and you, you led me to this obscure, difficult place, this difficult season where I feel lonely, I feel neglected. You begin to fear and Maybe you feel doomed to irrelevance. What do we do in these times? What is God trying to say to us? What is he trying to do? How long is what we typically ask. How long, Lord? How long do I have to be in this season? Because I feel like I'm in the wilderness. This wilderness time, like the Israelites that were just wandering around. I've been following you just like I had followed you before, God. Back then... But, you know, I haven't had a word. I haven't had a fresh opportunity. It's been a minute since I've had some Holy Spirit goosebumps. I just need a new revelation. And it doesn't feel the same. But you trust him. You trust him in the secret season. And you choose to hang on to faith. Remember, my definition of faith is knowing that God can. He can deliver you from this difficult time. But faith is trusting him even if he doesn't. Even if he says, I need you there a little bit longer. I need you to learn one more thing. You're going to have to sit in it just a little longer. I'm teaching you something. I'm building character in you. I'm doing something new. Can we acknowledge that? Oh, the hidden riches of secret places. Yeah, it's easy to say that when you're not in a secret season that you didn't choose for yourself. It's easy to say that when you chose to go spend some time with them and you feel so refreshed. When you're on the hills, but when you're in the valleys, maybe even the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes you feel like maybe you've peaked. Maybe your best days are behind you. Do I still have anything to give? And this can strike during an empty nest season. It can strike during a graduation or a transition or season. Or maybe in a season where you have grief or loss. Maybe you finished a course or maybe even finished a race. 
or sports season, or maybe you've finished a career, or a decade is over. Maybe you've turned that dreaded 50, that dreaded 60, that dreaded 70. And maybe you say, maybe I've gone as far as I can go. What now? What next, God? And God seems to be saying nothing. Those are the dark and the secret places you're going, maybe I'm a little too far in Glacier National Park and I'm a little scared of these bears, right? Maybe I'm in too deep. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. And God is saying, I'm here. I'm not far. Maybe you, in those times, you don't see the heavens breaking open and showing you an aurora borealis. You just see darkness all around. It's amazing to go on a hike sometimes, right? You know where you're going. You've got a trail. You've made a plan. And you go and you find it. You come up over the peak and there's this little stream going into a pond and a deer drinking water. And you're like, oh, this is amazing. But that same scene when you have no idea where you are, you have no idea how to get out. You're just lost in the woods. That's two different things. Planning to go and to experience that, going on a hike and knowing where you're going, how you're getting there and how you're going to get back is one thing. But the same scene of a deer drinking water by the stream when you have no idea how you got there and how you're going to get out, it's two totally different things. But God says they're still beautiful. It's still my creation, and I'm still meeting you here. And I want you to learn something. I want to show you something. It's just our perspective is different. The point is, there is purpose for you in the desert. There is purpose for you in the wilderness. There is purpose for you in a season of being a fear, of obsolescence. You have to two choices when you're in that situation. You can cling to what was past, or you can ready yourself for whatever is next. You can cling to what was, or you can ready yourself for what is. When the SEAL teams go dark, and nobody can get a hold of them, they still talk to each other. They haven't stopped talking, they've just switched channels. They're on a different channel. There's no more public communication, but there's private communication. Maybe when you feel dark and you feel alone, you just need to switch the channel. You need to quit looking for the world to give you answers, and you need to say, God, I need you. I need you to speak in my life. I am truly listening. Sometimes we're a little stubborn. And that time takes a little longer for the world to fade away. Perhaps you're in a season where the walkie-talkie has gone dark to the public, but you just need to talk with God. Let me give you some examples um, about what I'm talking about. Jesus in John 11, he has this story about one of his best friends. And you know it's his best friend um, because when he's dying, he doesn't go see him. You're like, what? That does not make sense. If your best friend's dying, you're going to go see him. Well, he had a best friend. His name was Lazarus. They sent word. His two sisters sent word. Lazarus is dying, Jesus. And his disciples are like, all right, we better go see Lazarus. And he goes, no, not yet. We're not going. They're like, Okay, maybe we're mad at Lazarus. Maybe we've had a little bit of feud. I don't, I don't know. But okay, Jesus says, no, we're not going. And so he loves Lazarus very much, but he chooses not to go. And then word is sent that Lazarus is dead. And they're like, uh, okay, Jesus, now, now what? And he's like, no, 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 he's not dead. He's just asleep. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And they're like, no, no, he's really dead. He's trying to help them understand, but, you know, Jesus and the disciples was kind of like a Keystone Cops relationship, right? He would say things that were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, and so they never really fully understood each other, and he was like, listen, he's dead, but that's good that we weren't there. Because I need you to, I need you to experience something. 
See, Jesus loved Lazarus. And Jesus knew things about his sickness, knew things about his life that the disciples had no idea of. They could only see what they could see on this earthly world, but Jesus had a connection with his Father, and he knew what's going on. He knew that he was the resurrection and the life. And he told that to Mary and Martha, like, yeah, yeah, I know. When we die, we're going to go to heaven. You're the resurrection and life. I get it. He goes, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. They still didn't get it. But when he called Lazarus out of that tomb, they got it. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the life. He knew ahead of time. He understood what was going on. He had a secret relationship. He knew his secret mission. He understood what's going on. God has a plan. And sometimes you feel like you're done and this life is over and you're a bit jaded with what's going on with whatever it is, your career, your situation, whatever this case may be. But if you'll face forward in the forward direction and let God begin to do something new and stir something new inside of you, you will see that what, is, what you think is the end, what the end to man is, It's just the beginning to God. And that's what Jesus was trying to show them. You don't understand the end. You don't get it. The world sees things as if things have died. Things are over. And just when you think things are over, God says, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. And so the disciples say, oh, uh, well, why did you do this? He said, I did this so you could understand that your your earthly understanding is so finite. You need to back it out. You need to see things. Our disappointment, our storms, our our desert seasons, if we lean into them, if we bring him to the situation and we trust him in the trial, then he will bring a new harvest. He will bring new things. Most fertile ground is because God has made it that. He puts his riches. What we think is a death, he doesn't see it that way. When we think we're buried, he says, no, you're just planted. You're just planted. If we aren't deceived by the things of this world and we choose instead to be developed, then just maybe, just maybe in those times, God will show himself and you will see that this pressure you're in has a purpose. When I was a kid, I was, wanted to play all kinds of sports. I decided I wanted to play tennis. And my dad, he was an engineer, and so he was always liking cool jet gadgets. And so he bought me this ball saver. And if you know anything about tennis balls, and you buy tennis balls and you open up the, the container, it's like, whoosh, right? It's pressurized. And so the, the pressure of the canister is pushing pressure on the balls, which makes the internal pressure better. So they can withstand the hits of the racket. And so he bought me this ball saver so that every time I put my balls in there, you would pump it up and it would put pressure on them. And the more outward pressure created a more inward pressure. And sometimes that's what God is doing, guys. He puts us in difficult situations where we're in pressure, and he pressurizes us so that when we're out there in the world and we're getting hit by the rackets of this world, we can withstand it. God does amazing things with darkness and pressure. If if you've ever gotten an engagement ring, That's a piece of coal put in darkness and pressure. And he pulls an amazing, beautiful thing out of that. God, if you allow him to kind of put you under the pressure and you seek him through it, then you will withstand the whims and the ways and the difficult seasons that this world puts upon you. So when you're put under pressure, 
you rise above it. Psalms 31, 20 says this, you shall hide them in the secret places of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. When the world's coming after you, God says, I got you. And maybe that dark place you were in was me hiding you, getting you ready so you could withstand the difficulties of this world when people come after you, when there's strife. God develops his best work in unseen places. If you ever doubt that, then just look at yourself. You were developed in darkness. Psalms 139.13 says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. If you feel like you're in darkness today, you feel like you're being formed, and you just are being prepared for a new birth, a new beginning, for a new transition, for a new level. So this is my encouragement to you. No matter what you're handed in life, assume God's positive intent. Assume that God has a positive reason for that. So you could rename the title of my sermon, Out of Sight, On His Mind. Not out of sight, out of mind. When you're out of sight of this world, you're on his mind. When you were in the darkness of your mother's womb, he was making you. He was forming you. He had a purpose. He had a plan for you. When you go through this life and you find yourself in dark places, he's still forming you. He's still making you. He is still planning things for you. He is trying to tell you the secret purpose in your life. Sometimes you say, but I'm out of sight. I feel all alone. I feel like I'm being buried. I feel like I'm being banished. I feel like I'm being forgotten. I feel like I'm in a storm. I feel like I'm unable to make it any longer. But this is where you flip it around. And you say, I'm believing God's best intent. So you say, I'm going to trust he's on the mountain praying for me. I'm going to trust that his eye is on me. I'm going to believe he's got plans and a purpose for me. So when I get handed, not what I deem to be a good thing, but I get handed a difficult situation, hard things from the hand of God, if I assume positive intent, I'm going to look at it through the lens of faith. That he doesn't just take me by still waters. He will do that. But then he takes me through the valley. The valley of the shadow of death. But the good news is, we always say this when we get to that Psalm 23. He takes me through you're going to get to the other side. You're going to be better for it. You're going to have the ability to withstand the pressures of this world. I'm going to interpret this difficult situation through the lens of God is trustworthy. I know he has the best intent. He means well for me. Can I give you an illustration of Sometimes we see the world for what it is, but God, he stands outside of time and he sees it differently than we do. And we've got to trust him that he sees things differently than we do. Let me give you an example of that. When you go and you stare out at the sky and you're looking at the moon, you're not seeing it where it is, you're seeing it where it was. One and one-third seconds ago is where you're seeing it. 
It's already moved. You can't see it for where it really is. It's already moved. If you want to look at the sun, not a good idea, by the way, but if you want to look at the sun, then it's even further away. And it would be eight minutes and 30 seconds already moved. Where you're seeing it, it's already eight minutes and 30 seconds further along. You're seeing it in history. You're not seeing it in real time. You may go, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, what's the big deal? A few seconds here or there. Well, how about the North Star? The North Star is what, you know, people in ships would use to get to places. The North Star, we say, that helps us find our way. If you're looking at the North Star, that thing is a long ways away. It is 323 light years away, if you want to know how far that is. And so here's the deal. When you're looking at it, you're looking at it where it was 323 years ago. Before the United States existed, folks. The, the North Star could be burnt out. We don't know. We won't know for many years. We are looking at a universe through a lens that is so incomplete. And if we can't trust the God who created it, who stands outside of time and knows everything about you, who formed you, who made you, who has a purpose for you and a plan for you, you're going to have a hard time. If you're trusting what you can see, trust me. From a blind guy, don't do it. I'll run into a door as quick as anything. But spiritually, compared to God, we're blind. And you're going to have to seek him. You'll stumble upon him. But he wants you to come find him. And then when he puts you in a dark place, don't resist. Say, what's next, God? I know you see a bigger picture. I trust you. I want to see the shimmering lights of the northern lights. I want to go to the dark places. I want to go deep into the wilderness. I want to spend time with you. I want to see you for your fullness. I want to see your beauty. I'm okay with this world and my difficult life interacting with you and your purpose and your plan and your secret plan for me. And when that happens, it creates a beautiful, beautiful display. And I pray that God will do that in your life. I pray that the people around you will see that and they will stop just like my wife did on the side of the road and go, wow. And not wow because of you, but wow because look at what God is doing in and through you just because you're letting him. So I encourage you today, if you're watching online and you say, David, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm so confused. Stars being 323 years away and God's a creator and he made me in my mother's womb. I don't get it. I don't have a relationship. Then I implore you. Begin a relationship with Jesus today. Get to know him. He knew you. When he died on the cross, he took the nails. And he could have called out your name and my name. I still am blown away by that. But thousands of years ago, he could have said, David Robbins, I'm dying for you. For the things you've done, the things you're doing, and the things you will do. I know all of it. And I still love you. And so he wants you to seek him. Admit you've made mistakes. Believe that Jesus died as your substitute to pay your sin debt. And then choose to begin a relationship with the day. And if today's your day, then mark it down on the calendar. Tell somebody about it. And we want to rejoice with you. But if you say, I've already done that, but I don't really feel that close. Then you're going to have to go find your secret place. You're going to have to spend time with him. He wants you some one-on-one -on -one time. He wants to spend time with you, not with you and YouTube, not with you and work. He wants to spend time with you. He made you. He loves you. He has a plan. He has a purpose for you. Seek him, and he will find, you will find him. Knock, and the door will be open. He'll never slam it on you. He's never too busy in his lazy boy. He's not lazy. He's always busy. He's always at work, but he always has time for you. So let's, uh, let's
Let's pray as John comes up to lead us. I just want you all to, when John leads in this final song, I just want you to meditate on that. Meditate on maybe where you are, that dark place, or, or maybe a dark place you've been, and you're, you're like, what did I really learn from that? And just say, God, I want you to reveal yourself. I want to know you. I want to see you. I want to see your face. If you remember from the, the first week we talked about it, there was this woman who was blind, and she memorized all this scripture. And people asked her, well, didn't you... Didn't you ever want to just wave a magic wand and not be blind? And she said, no, I want to get to heaven, and I want the first face I ever see will be the face of God. And so I want you, as you worship right now, to just seek the face of God. And then this week, your assignment is to find some secret places, find some secret time, get to know God. So let's stand and let's sing. Lord, we just ask that you would just let your face shine upon each person that's here, that your glory would be with them, that they would be 
a light into this dark world. Let them be northern lights with southern hospitality as they head out of here. Lord, let people see you at work in their lives where they live and work and play. And let them be able to tell them the story of Jesus and the changed life that they are. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, guys. We'll see you next week. Amen.